So hello, Ansara, and to all people who might be watching this talk. Um, before Ansara and I begin our conversation, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking today from Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land in Nam, Melbourne. And I'd like to acknowledge the thousands of years of storytelling and art making by First Nations people that continues today. Ansara Clark's exhibition, Landscape Familiar, is presented online at the Incinerator Gallery website and will also be on show at locations within Mooney Valley um, in early 2021. The exhibition looks at ideas around inheritance and family identity across multiple domains. And it is a walkthrough and a reflection of your own family history, Ansara, and your family's evolution. But I think it also addresses broader ideas about what strengths and also what vulnerabilities might persist across generations. So Ansara, hello. Thank you very much for spending time with me today. How are you? Oh, great. Thank you, Amy. And um, thanks for taking time to talk to me today about the exhibition. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Um, so as I was looking through the exhibition text and some images that you sent, I, I noticed that you framed Landscape Familiar as a, a non-figurative portrait project, which I think is such a good antidote to the way that so many people are engaging with each other over the last couple of months. We've all been like relating to each other in quite a like a disembodied and screen-based way. And I wondered yeah. if you'd be able to elaborate about how you think about portraiture in relation to the exhibition. Um, I think about portraiture generally as about um, people's stories and that is always more than how they look um, or how they dress on any particular day. So while certainly portraiture um, tells us a lot about a person and gives an image to hold on, it's not the whole story mm. and it doesn't reveal all those sort of inner layers and secrets and all of those really interesting aspects that make people sort of really interesting and also help us um, locate and look at how they are in their worlds. Mm. That's so, so that's... nice to think, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's all right, okay. Um, it's so nice to think what you've just said about uh, like layers, because that feels pretty um, prominent in a work that you identified as being the catalyst for some of your thinking around this project. So I know that Landscape Familiar has evolved really considerably from its conception, um, to now, and you mentioned that the work called Dress of Solitary Musings was a catalyst for you moving this project from more of an exploration of representations of the external lives of your ancestors to reflections on the genetic or psychological or energetic inheritances that have passed down through generations in your family. Are you able to describe that work to us and also to let us know what part of the process of creating Dress of Solitary Musings informed that mental shift about the project? Yeah, so I'll just start by saying layering is something that's really common in a lot of my work, um, both materially and in processes and also um, conceptually and in terms of the stories they carry too. So it's sort of a, an underlying um, sort of staple of my practice. Um, but in terms of that piece of work, um, I've, I've been wanting to, um, I've made a lot of paper garments, but I've been wanting to abstract those forms um, and embed a, a more sort of conceptual um, approach into them for a while. And so the first lockdown gave me a chance to really start to explore that. And concurrent with starting that dress, I was observing myself and how I was surviving I was observing other people and how they were surviving and I started or weren't surviving um, and I started to think a lot about the qualities that um, sustain us when life is difficult and when mm. life is challenging um, and I could really see differences in people around me those that were doing it really well and those that were not doing it so well um, and I was looking also, I guess, at people that were sort of being left out of the conversation, um, people that, who are often invisible, but becoming even more invisible in that context, like elderly people, mm. people living with disabilities, people who are immune compromised, um, those sorts of issues. So they're the sorts of things that sort of started flowing through my mind you know i'd read facebook and social media posts where people were complaining because they couldn't go to their favorite coffee shop and you know and i was thinking well you know for a lot of people 
going to a coffee shop is is a big event and something they can't do anyway. So it sort of really started started this process of thinking about, you know, where does our resilience come from? Where does our capacity to cope from? Mm -hmm. um, which brings us back to the nature nurture element. But because I was also looking at the body of work for Landscape Familiar, then I wasn't thinking about nature nurture just in the present moment, you know, um, mm -hmm. the DNA versus family in the present moment. And at the same time, I was looking at a lot of photos of um, particularly women in the family who all look really dour and serious in the in the photos, which is partly the photo style of the times. Mm. But also, um, knowing that their stories um, were ones that were quite a lot of hardship for them, and they fundamentally held their families together um, and had to give up, you know, personal lives, but mm. were really successful in being resilient in challenges. And so that was the sort of trigger as I as I sort of wandered through these musings, some of which were mine, some of which were other people's, yeah. So does it feel like then, um, you talked about the layering, photography, and some kind of textile-based processes. When you've been looking back on those images, has it reframed the way that you've been thinking about the social or personal experiences that are part of your family history? Um, yeah, it has. Um, I, I've delved a lot more deeply into the story, but I think a lot of the stories of individuals um, have been fleshed out for me. Mm -hmm. And some of that, some of that is about um, <clears throat> reimagining because, you know, the, the details that you know of stories are what you know, particularly if they're a couple of generations old and, and there's no one left alive that remembers the mm. particular stories. So, so some of that has to do with almost like an immersive meditative engagement with the images and the pieces of work the material that you know and allowing those stories to to rise out of out of the known um, and that so that's sort of given me a whole different aspect on my ancestry if you like um, and some of the stories there i'm really fortunate in that um, my parents and some of the other relatives um, of their generation have done a lot of the genealogy work Mm. So I don't have to, I don't have to track down birth certificates and date, dates, you know, dates of death and all of that sort of stuff. And there's quite a lot of volume of family tree and letters and recipes mm. and paper cuttings and stuff that are already collected. So I don't have to do that work. I've got the luxury of sort of just immersing myself in the material that's there. That's really interesting to have this family archive that merges I guess ideas of the past and the present and the future um, and I identify those themes pretty strongly when I've been looking at the images that we've seen of your work and your text. Um, how do you see your role within your family dynamic when it comes to recording and preserving and maybe even contributing to a further archive of your family history? Um, I see my role as a storyteller in a way because a lot of the fact collection has been done um, and and so I sort of see my role as a storyteller, um, both in terms of fleshing out the stories that are there, but in terms of, I suppose, enlarging them and making them more accessible to the generations to come. Um, you know, we've got heirloom objects that can be linked into those stories and they will go down to, you know, generations to come as well, so. I love that idea of enlarging the stories that are your family stories. And I guess that that's, um, it, it's something that came through kind of strongly about these ideas of unpaid labor, um, value of caring, invisible care, and also the unprofiled histories of your family as ancestors. Um, yeah. It seems like you do have a lot of material to draw on. Have you been able to develop more of an understanding about your family ancestors through the domestic records that they've left behind? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, it, it's interesting because the material that I've got, there's, um, photo, there's articles from newspapers um, and they're all about, you know, the fabulous works of all the men in the family um, uh, and the really public sort of lives and women are more or less mentioned as, you know, having lost someone or being a partner to someone or Mrs. Mm. whatever. Um, but the there's a few personal letters from the women um, and there's some, you know, recipes and cooking books, but there's a lot of linen um, and textile, mm. you know, that they all spent hours and hours and making these elaborate sort of cloths and doilies and 
and those sorts of things. So there's quite a lot of um, linen and domestic objects, you know, um, um, cake forks and you know, knife, bone handled knives and, and those sorts of things. And they speak volumes about, um, you know, the lives of those women that they were mm. caring lives. And um, I was particularly fascinated by uh, the story of my grandmother. She had a number of sisters and she was the youngest and she was, she was born in 1899, very radical for her time. She traveled by herself when, you know, usually young women, single women had to be chaperoned. She mm. uh, nursed for a while during the war, she had a nursing career and she married very late to a, a younger man. Um, mm. Ultimately, she still ended up in a maternal caring role, but she really sort of broke the mold and she was quite um, a vivacious and cheeky and, and even as an old woman, you know, still a little bit radical in her own way um, mm. and very open. And so those, there were real contrasts to what I know of the lives of some of the other women who did all the right things, um, looked after people and still ended up having to live with children once mm. their husband dies because there was no resource for them to survive on a loan or basically living, you know, as a boarder in someone's front room. Mm. Almost a bit like what's happening to lots of older women today, mm. actually. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I, some of those things are the stories that it's sort of easy to flesh out and imagine what the actual daily parts of their lives would be like. Mm. And I think that fleshing out plays a role in this, um, this kind of sense of emotional intimacy that's created by your works. And in some part, I'm glad you're nodding because I wasn't sure if I was like projecting that onto the work, but they do feel yeah, emotionally intimate. And I think yeah. that's in part due to the, like, the small scale of some of the works, which calls the viewer to like, really hone in on the details. Yeah but also the use of personal materials such as hair, which I know um, is prominent in some of the pieces in this exhibition. Is, can you speak a little bit about that? Is that something you're very conscious of creating an emotional space when you're making the work or do you feel like it's incidental because of material or, or process? No, the emotional space is really important. And in a way it's how I measure the success of a piece is the sort of emotional connection or emotional impact mm. that it has on people. Um, that because, because fundamentally I'm a visual storyteller. Mm. Um, I, I'm really interested in, in not just telling my stories, but creating a space where other people can work through, reflect on, generate, live through their own stories. Mm. Because a lot, of our, a lot of our experiences are fairly universal. Um, and while the details of our stories might differ sometimes the lines of stories there's a lot of connections mm -hmm. between people um, and so to create to have that emotional intimacy and create places where people can connect with stories that are as much theirs as they are mine mm. is um is really important to me but it's also a privilege too to be able to to create and hold those spaces for people so that they can connect more deeply with themselves mm. um, and start to reflect um, about you know life and living and, and their impact in the world and, and you know all the sorts of themes that that are important in my work yeah. mm. and I guess your work the end result not always but very often is um, textile and garment related um, the garments aren't necessarily wearable and I know that you have some thoughts about how a garment might be read differently when the physical body is separated out from the garment um, can you speak a little bit about that yeah, um, garment garment forms are really important to me. Um, in my early years, my first sort of real technical studies were in garment construction and fashion design. And so that's sort of like where my base skill um, from all those years ago is. So when I started to move um, into, into a practice, it was really natural for me to start to use those forms. But I, but I really love garments. Garments are so... Mm -hmm. Um, they're such signifiers for us. Um, you know, we all wear clothes, mostly, um, and we sometimes choose to dress to, to send certain messages, and sometimes by not choosing to send messages, we're sending messages through garments anyway. Mm. The other thing about garments is that um, a lot of the time I make life-size or nearly life-size garments, and I often hang them so that where the head should be is where the viewer will we'll sort of like view the garment from because it's easy to put imaginatively whatever body you like in the garment whether it be mm. your own 
or somebody else's and then you can have a conversation or a dialogue with that piece of work so by leaving a body out of the garment you create a space for either the viewer to put themselves or somebody in there and, and then intensify the intimacy of their interaction with the work mm. or you allow the story of the garment to um, dominate rather than be linked automatically mm. to a particular type of a body. I think that's really awesome because by holding the space in the way that you've just described, like leaving a, a bodiless garment in the space of the head, you're creating what um, could be quite a neutral space, but actually there's still the emotion there, which I think like emotion is a very specific feeling. So that's a, a, a pretty amazing narrative balance to me, like the neutral and the emotional. So um, yeah, that's something that I've really loved from seeing your work. Yeah, and it's quite, it can be quite a challenge to, to achieve when you're making work. And I think that some of the, the extended process is mm. what tips it into that space. You know, if mm. I was making some of these works really quickly, knocking them over in a day or whatever, mm. um, I don't think that they would contain that quality. I think it's almost that immersive quality in the making um, allows those nuances to be discovered and felt and then reflected in the work. You know, mm. it's, it's, almost a, it's almost a little bit um, of that shape-shifting shamanic type quality you know of singing something into into a work but in this mm. case it's stitching mm. over time yeah and that's um that that stitching over time is linked to the title of a work that you have on the show um it's a video work the only video work in the show um called yeah. meticulous imperfection hand stitching as a radical act which i think is a great title and philosophy and I think that the idea of like, the small scale, the personal and the radical act is something that inter interacts um, really well with contemporary conversation about subverting mass production and mass consumption, acting with thoughtfulness and care, tenderness, those kind of words. Can you talk a little bit about how you see hand stitching fitting into the realm of the radical? Um, I I think it's like, number one, we live in a culture where we value materials and we value um, processes where things are perfect. You know, you, people buy things from the shop and if they're not perfect, they take them back. Um, mm. we, we want to know if something is made from gold rather than plastic or, you know, linen rather than, than paper. Um, so we have a lot of value base about um, materials and things meeting a certain um, certain sort of level of, of, of value ascription. And we also have a lot of um, value base around productivity um, and in our work lives and in our personal lives, people are expected to do, to achieve, to have a certain agenda, to tick the things off on the agenda and to meet all those things. Um, and my work is really about the opposite. It's actually about valuing human creativity and human labour, whether it's stitching on a tea bag that you fished out of the rubbish or whether it's using gold leaf on, mm. on something. Um, it, the, the value is in the human ingenuity and the time that goes into it rather than um, the quickness of the work or the processes or the perfection or the machine quality of the work. And I think that that's much deeper um, in terms of how we treat and see each other. And some of um, my experience comes from um, around that has been really profoundly influenced by um, living with chronic fatigue syndrome for 14 years, um, where it's a, you really have to come to terms with the fact that you can't meet the value systems of the culture in the way that you once did. And people either don't see it or they look at you quite differently if you don't if you don't meet it, they, they think that you're not trying hard enough and mm. things like that. So, um, so I'm really wanting to tell a story about, you know, let's stop and look at what value individuals give to us in their own rights and in their own ways, um, rather than just describing one normalised sort of value standard. You've mentioned the word um, story and storyteller and narrative so often, mm. and I wonder, is there a narrative through the work that feels 
most prominent to you. Like there's the migration story, the family ancestry story, um, the material and process story. Um, I think for me, the the narrative that that comes through the whole through the different threads of the story um, is what comes to rest in me in my life in this moment. And that is about resilience um, and capacity to um, adapt and change and try and find ways to thrive in the circumstances mm. that you are given. Um, and that doesn't remove the fact that um, that it's challenging and people and myself, you might not do things well all the time, um, but, you know, there's a store of resources there that we could draw on. Um, now, whether that is inherited through DNA, whether through that's inherited through epigenetic um, factors like mechanisms other than DNA, or whether it's inherited through uh, mitochondrial DNA, which comes down through the, the mother, or whether it's a function of reflecting on the stories and learning and growing from those, um, I think that's the, you know, that's sort of the, the fundamental thing for me is drawing on those those strengths that overcome our imperfections or overcome our vulnerabilities and the things that could drive us back and gathering the resources that can help lift us up and carry us forward. We have covered a lot of ground and I wonder we have, if, have we? <laughs> if there's any points of reference or insights into the exhibition that you'd like to offer the audience. Um, the exhibition's online, so it's sort of quite an interesting um, process because mostly my exhibitions are, um, you know, in the gallery um, where people um, can walk up and look at the work and often people go, oh, wow, I didn't realise this was paper. Um, so I, I suppose I'd encourage people to zoom in on the images um, and have a little look at the detail um, about, about the work because it is very textured, it is very layered um, and and I encourage people to spend time with with the works because of that laying in texture and the opportunity to really um, you know sort of travel through a story and maybe into your own um, but they're probably the sorts of key key things and I'm sure that for lots of people there'll be resonances back into their own family histories whether they're known whether they know a lot about them or, or not you know you can use that imaginative reflective realm to sort of draw out the, the keys um, and draw out places where you can take take that history and take yourself into a better place that's so nice to i guess leave the audience with an invitation to go deeper into their own um yeah research and reflection yeah yeah i mean i mean that's the that's the, that's the storytelling link, you know, that's, that's the reason we tell stories, um, you know, as individuals and as cultures is, is to um, embody ourselves more fully to increase our understanding and also to connect with each other as well. Mm. And that seems to be really salient in the current world. <laughs> Absolutely. I am. Um... I never really know how to like end or wrap up things like this. But I, I guess I'd just like to say thank you so much for offering all of those insights. I feel like even though I, um, I guess knew quite a bit about the exhibition before speaking today, I feel like I've got this new and deeper understanding of your thought process and the works that we'll see online and somewhere in Rooney Valley in 2021. Watch this space. Right. Thank you very much, Amy. <laughs>